What is life about? Do you understand the, the purpose of life, why you're here? What meaning does life hold for you? These are questions we're going to explore in our program today from the book of Ecclesiastes. Stay tuned. The good news was written and the full truth revealed that the church might be whole and Christ's fullness made real. Our Lord in His wisdom gave Him gifts from above. The Spirit then taught Him the truth in love. Welcome to The Truth in Love, and now your host, Dave Miller. On our program today, we're going to examine the book of Ecclesiastes. Here's a powerful 12-chapter book that is designed to convey to every human being on this planet the meaning of life. This is important stuff, Avon. Avon sure. Malone is with me today. Avon, let's look at this book and see what we can learn about our purpose in life and, and why we're here, why... Why has God created a planet and placed human beings upon it? I guess if we interviewed the six billion people on the planet, most probably wouldn't be able to answer that question. Would you agree? I, I believe that's true. Andre Maroy raised that question. He said, why are we here on this puny mud heap spinning in space? Mm. And he said, I have not the slightest idea, mm. and I'm completely convinced no one else has the least idea. Well, it's unfortunate if that's true, but I think that might be... Uh, True to a very great extent, as you've suggested. Well, I suppose if we did not have a divine being communicating to us why we're here, then it, that, that idea would be up for grabs. And yeah. one person's idea would be as good as another. But, but there is a God, and we do That's have right. the Bible, and we do know the meaning of life as God has revealed it to us. Let's look at this first chapter where we are informed uh, that the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. So we have presumed, scholars have presumed, this is Solomon speaking to us, and he, he begins uh, kind of laying out the thesis of the book, Vanity of Vanities, All is Vanity, is this version. Is that um, American Standard have vanity? Vanity also? of vanities, okay. saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit has a man from all his labor in, in which he toils under the sun? So there's kind of the question. What's the point of life? Why That's are right. we here doing what we're doing? And at least initially, and as you proceed through this book, you kind of get the impression that life is pretty vain. It's pretty uh, negative. It's kind of depressing. Uh, futile, some versions use. Futility mm -hmm. or meaninglessness. And uh, as he proceeds here in chapter 1, he describes some of the cycles of life around us. Uh, the cycle of uh, humanity. One generation passing away, another comes into place. Verse 4 uh, the sun goes up, the sun goes down, the wind blows around. Even nature itself is in kind of a perpetual cycle where everything is going through the same uh, seemingly meaningless uh, cycling. And then he goes on, talks about the rivers, verse 7. Uh, verse 8, he turns to human beings to the, uh, on down through verse 11, what, how humans are... Uh, what, never satisfied, he says. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, the ear with hearing. And uh, look at verse nine. That which has been, uh, what uh, that which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there's nothing new under the sun. He keeps using these recurring phrases in this book, uh, especially in these early chapters. The vanity idea. Uh, there's nothing new under the sun. And I think the first time he uses the third phrase is in verse 14. A grasping for the wind, grabbing the wind. Is it not the case that he keeps reiterating these same three expressions over and over to try to accentuate a point? What, it, what specifically does he mean by these three statements? I think that Solomon is underscoring the fact that life without God and without a recognition of eternity and the mm -hmm. eternal dimension would be empty, mm -hmm. would be vain, okay. would be uh, a striving after the wind. Now that you know uh, that expression is uh, graphic. It really is. It really I, is. I've never tried it myself, but <laughs> if I saw somebody that trying to grab pretty, the wind, pretty futile, pretty pointless. I would think that something's wrong with him. That's they need right. to be checked out. That's exactly out. right. Well, repeatedly <clears throat> he uses that expression: vanity mm -hmm. of vanity, all is vanity, and a vexation of spirit, all is a striving after the wind. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, in a sense, much of it, and I think there's some keys that would uh, put this in a, a proper focus and perspective. 
but much of it appears to be a very fatalistic view. Mm -hmm. And when he goes through this uh, material about the continual cycle, mm -hmm. evidenced in nature, evidenced by the passing of generation after generation and so on, uh, he says, man is weary of this mm -hmm. and who can utter it? It's an inexpressible weariness. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he, oh, he just continues to strike the same notes over and over yes. and over again. But it impresses <clears throat> you with the fact that there is a certain futility, a certain emptiness, mm -hmm. uh, almost a dark fatalism if we fail to be aware of the Almighty our responsibility and relationship with Him, mm -hmm. the need to fear God and keep His commandments, mm -hmm. and if we overlook the eternal dimension. And I think <clears throat> He proves that really by His own experimentation. Uh, let's look at verse 13. That's exactly what I was going to suggest that you call our attention to in verse 13. Isn't that what He's saying there? That He, he as Solomon, is intending to experiment. Uh, elaborate a little further on that. Well, it's not, a, it's not despite His vast wisdom, this is not primarily a process of reasoning, but it's rather a matter of experimentation. I am going to approach all the sources and all the founts that, that men go to in this insatiable quest for fulfillment, for happiness, for joy, mm -hmm. for a sense of meaning and purpose. Mm -hmm. I'm going to test it out that way, and I think that's what he's saying here. Okay. I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all that's done under the sun. It's a sore travail that God has given to the sons of men to be exercised therewith. He'll say in the next verse at the end, all is vanity, a striving after the wind. Mm -hmm. But he, he says, I commune with my own heart. Verse 16, I've gotten me great wisdom, and I applied my heart to no wisdom. Verse 17, and I perceived that this also was a striving after the wind, for in much wisdom is much grief. I think that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. In a world of unsolvable problems, uh -huh. one of the saddest possessions would be wisdom but inability to do anything about mm -hmm. so much. Mm -hmm. uh, Thomas Carlyle said the most finished products of the brain's activity brings not pleasure but pain. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've looked over some things I've tried to write and said, yes, I understand that. <laughs> mm. <laughs> well, in verse 18 there, he also mentions knowledge in the parallelism. That's right. So you're in telling much me wisdom that... wisdom is mm. much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increase, increases sorrow. So he can't be talking about knowledge of God or knowledge no, of spiritual things. I think he's talking he has about just in a mind general... here human wisdom. Okay. Uh, the statement of the Queen of the South could describe both his wisdom and his wealth. The half has never yet been told. Mm. And if anyone could have found complete fulfillment and ultimate satisfaction in wisdom or wealth or mm -hmm. pleasure or power. Mm -hmm. Here's the guy who could because he had all of that mm -hmm. in tremendous abundance. So the scholar, the intellectual, the person who has devoted his, life, his or her life to just pursuing the acquisition of information, knowledge, being an expert on this area or that area, when it's all said and done, if that's all there is to life, becoming an expert on, uh, let's say, a uh, uh, botany, you know, knowing exactly how every leaf and every plant on the planet operates and know the intricacies, the cellular structure. If that's all there is to, to life, even though you've acquired knowledge that most people will never acquire in terms mm -hmm. of its, its depth and breadth, then life is meaningless and, and a waste of time. Let's go on into chapter 2 where he moves into another area of pursuit that he applied himself to. What's he after there? Uh, pleasure, according to verse 1. Okay. I will prove thee with mirth and therefore enjoy pleasure. And behold, this also was vanity. And he'll later say, I had my men singers down in verse 8, mm -hmm. my women singers, the delights of the sons of men. He'll go on to say, I withheld nothing from, from myself, from the sight of my eyes. Mm -hmm. And yet that too was empty. Look at verse uh, 4 and 5 and 6 there. When people think about accomplishing great feats of labor, uh, it's impressive. What, what does he point out there? Well, uh, wealth doesn't bring satisfaction. And even, well, this could be called a kind of cultural attempt. I've built parks. I've had trees planted. I've made me gardens. And yet in all this accomplishment and in, uh, in all this beautification, mm. uh, I did not find uh, satisfac satisfaction or fulfillment. He even says there in verse uh, 8, 
that he became great and excelled more than all who were before him in Jerusalem. So he, he claims to surpass any who have preceded him. And he's been talking there, as you say, about uh, pleasure, about the, uh, the great feats of accomplishment, projects, I guess you could say, uh, works of labor. Um, his summary on that, this little section, is it not, is verse 11. I looked on all the works that my hands had done, on the labor in which I had toiled, and indeed all was vanity, grasping for the wind, no profit under the sun. There's those three phrases, key expressions in the book used all in the same verse very rapidly there. What about verse 12 and following? What's he after there? What does he, um, what does he describe he pursued in that section of chapter 2? Well, in this section he will admit that wisdom is better than folly, but there is one event common to the wise man and the fool, and that strikes him heavily. Mm. And it would seem the one event is an inevitable death and then what's become of my wisdom? And, and uh, what really, when you look to that end, and much of, much of the book is dealing really with life under the sun, mm -hmm. as if that's the, the totality of it. Mm -hmm. Now, he lets us know that's not the totality of it. And there are a couple of places where <coughs> vital keys come out. But mm -hmm. if it's just life under the sun, yes, wisdom is better than folly. And yet, how... Uh, uh, how endeth the fool and how endeth the wise man? Well, they both die. There is, there is an inevitable summons awaiting mm -hmm. both. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the end of both, in a sense, in terms of physical existence, is the same. It's the same. Yeah. And, uh, and thus he sees uh, human wisdom alone doesn't really solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And so there's something the, awaiting me that awaits the uh, foolish one. No matter how great people have been on this planet, you look back over human history and think of the people that were count, accounted great by history, whether it was a great military leader, you know, Napoleon or Hitler or uh, the great military strategists of our own country. Mm -hmm. If you think about uh, academicians, men who achieve uh, astronomers like Galileo and people like that, or you think about great medical men that found cures to heinous diseases, any field of endeavor that you want to pursue, they've all come to the same end. Mm -hmm. When it's all said and done, mm -hmm. they live their life and it comes to a close like every other person's mm -hmm. life who never accomplished all of those great mm -hmm. things. Is that the idea that he's getting at? I think at? so, and Solomon illustrates all of these. Possessions, mm -hmm. wealth, uh, wisdom, mm -hmm. uh, pleasure, power. Uh, now you have examples in all of those uh, historical figures and others. Right. Lord Byron decided he was going to gratify his appetites and satisfy his desires. And at the end of a life like that, he said, uh, the worm, the grief, the canker are mine. Mm -hmm. uh, we mentioned in an earlier study about some who were very wealthy. Mm -hmm. Jay Gould, who said, I'm the most miserable man on earth. Right. I wish I'd never been born. Uh, Lord yeah. Beaconsfield was a fellow who had an uncommon measure of position, prestige, preeminence, uh, exercise of a certain power. And he said, youth is a mistake, manhood a struggle, old age a regret. Hmm. Well, all of these fellows are saying, I didn't find it in that, in that particular fount or source to which I went. And Solomon hmm. tried all of those and more. <clears throat> Remember in 1929, uh, when the stock market crashed here in this country, there were people that jumped out of windows, committed mm -hmm. suicide, ended their lives because to them, for their stocks to crash, for their money to evaporate, was for life to evaporate, mm -hmm. apparently. Mm -hmm. Would you comment on chapter 3? Here is a very famous section uh, made into a song in the 60s mm -hmm. in my generation mm -hmm. by the birds. A time, uh, there is a purpose uh, for every purpose, there's a time for every purpose under heaven. What, what's he getting at in these first eight verses of chapter three, a time for this, a time for that? Well, I think in effect he's saying that there are, a, there's a great variety of human experiences and in their place and in their time and the appropriate uh, part of our lives, uh, then these things are, are, are right. Uh, interestingly, there's about 28 times here and he just keeps saying, you know, a time mm. to build up, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, et cetera, et cetera. I think <clears throat> that he is leading up to one of the great keys after you come through this. Mm. He talks about a time to love, a time to hate. 
And then finally, what profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? What really does it profit? Mm -hmm. I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised therewith. And now here's a verse that I believe is one of the keys. I think, I think uh, if you miss some of these, you're going to say, this is just fatalistic. I chapter, don't understand chapter it. Chapter 3, verse 11. He made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has set eternity in their heart. And I believe that's a key. Hmm. He has uh, put eternity in the minds of men. One translation has it. And here are the American standard. He has set eternity in their heart. If you rule out the eternal dimension and you look only at life under the sun, then you could well conclude with some of these men I've mentioned and with, with the conclusion that Solomon draws so far as this life under the sun is concerned. Wealth, wisdom, uh, power, position, prestige. He rules over a great kingdom from the river to the land of the Philistines unto the border of Egypt, 1 Kings 4.21. That's mm -hmm. the very extent that was promised mm -hmm. to Abraham's posterity when God spoke to Abraham in Genesis 15.18. Mm -hmm. So he wields the scepter of authority over a vast kingdom. His wealth is so immense. I think I mentioned this to you one time earlier. Uh, students have tried to get the, take the biblical data and come up with a conclusion as to the extent of Solomon's fortune. Mm -hmm. And their conclusion has been, could you stand beside Solomon, a Rockefeller or a Carnegie or a Sam Walton, these fellows would be penniless paupers, mm. homeless wanderers by comparison. Mm. And so of his wealth, of his wisdom, of his power, he had access to all kinds of pleasure. You could say the half has never yet been told. As, uh, and yet Solomon, in effect, is saying, I never found real mm lasting fulfillment mm. in any of that. Any of that. And if, if you mm. rule out the eternal dimension and it's just life under the sun, mm -hmm. then that's let's, about what you're left with. Let's go back to 1 Kings and, and dwell upon that just a little bit. I think you made a tremendous point. In 1 Four, Kings... 421 and, and 1 okay. Kings deals with that. Of course, okay. there's other material there. Where he, uh, that shows the extent of his geographical reign, you mean, and, and uh, the acquisition of dominion over men. That's right. Chapter, that's... 1 Kings 4, beginning in verse 21. You know, back in uh, chapter 3 was where he requested wisdom from God, and God granted that request. Then in chapter 4, verse uh, 26, he had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots, 12,000 horsemen. He comes on and talks about how those were cared for. He comes on down in verse 29 and talks about how his wisdom and great understanding and largeness of heart uh, were so great that, look at verse 30, his wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. And then it lists a number of famous individuals of the day who, uh, where his wisdom excelled them. Look at verse 30, uh, 32, he was a poet and uh, a musician. It says he spoke 3,000 proverbs. His songs were 1,005. You know, we have the book of Proverbs. There's probably mm -hmm. only, what, 300 or so in that book. And here, we're told that he did at least 3,000. Verse 33 shows that he was a botanist. He spoke of trees, cedar of Lebanon, the hyssop that springs out of the wall. So he apparently went out and studied nature and, and uh, the uh, intricacies of the created order. It says he also spoke of animals, birds. That made him an ornithologist, right? Uh, creeping things, fish, that's an ichthyologist. He studied fish. Um, Verse, it says that chapter ends telling us that men of all the nations from all the kings of the earth came just to hear what he had to say on matters. So I could see why the, the quotation that you alluded to would say that uh, he, he dwarfed other men by his achievements. Mm -hmm. In chapter 5, he prepares to build, of course, the great temple. In chapter 6, it's constructed. In chapter 7, he then gets busy and builds some other buildings, including his own palace, his own home of cedar, which took 13 years to build. And it, it is quite a description in terms of the, the pillars, the columns, and so forth. Uh, you come on down, and there's more about the temple in that chapter. The temple is inaugurated or dedicated in chapter 8. Look at chapter um, 9. There's some fascinating details here about his influence over the world of his day. Talk about a politician, 
or a conqueror, an individual that exerted his influence and his uh, impact upon the world around him. Uh, I believe in, in verse 26 we have a description of his navy, don't we? He actually built a navy that uh, acquired uh, great wealth for him from different parts of the world. You alluded to the statement that the Queen of Sheba made. That's in chapter 10 where she said the half, the half has not been told. What about um, verse 14 of chapter 10 is where we begin to get kind of a calculation of his wealth. And I believe that's probably the section you were alluding to where if you were to calculate that, he would make the Carnegies mm -hmm. and the Rockefellers and the who was the fellow out in Nevada that uh, died several years ago that uh, kind of died a recluse? Uh, How are you talking about Howard that? Hughes. Yeah, Howard and Hughes. And think right. of the ones today, you know, the Donald Trumps, the Bill Gates, the fellows that have amassed massive fortunes in our day. And yet when you calculate the amount of gold and silver that he acquired for himself, it's incredible, isn't it? And mm -hmm. I've always been impressed by chapter 10, verse 18. His throne, overlaid with ivory, uh, or pure gold. It was a throne of ivory overlaid with gold. It had six steps leading up to it with uh, lions, big massive lion statues at each end of those steps. So that would be what, 12, 12 lion 12 statues. Lions, yeah. And uh, he even had them fixed on the armrests of his throne. And uh, the, all of his drinking vessels, verse 21, made out of gold and so forth. Um, an incredible man in terms of his physical accomplishment. I can't help but stop and think that um, if we sit here and think, well, you know, if I could just do all that and know all that and accomplish all that, I'd be happy. Mm -hmm. But this book says that's not true, does mm -hmm. it? That's not, the, that's not the source of happiness. That's not the location of contentment. Well, that's a little bit of a sidetracking. Let's go back to Ecclesiastes unless you want to comment further on that. I wanted us to continue on in Ecclesiastes. I think it was helpful to look <clears throat> at that and to see that uh, he really did experience all of this mm. and yet he was not in that happy. Yes. You know, mm. uh, we could have gone to 1 Kings 11 which shows um, his marital situation, his sexual involvement. A lot of people today would think that happiness comes by sexual liaisons with people. That's probably a very prominent thought in our society mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. But Solomon surpassed everybody in that. And he didn't find it there. No, he did not. He had access to many, many women. What about <clears throat> Ecclesiastes chapter 4 where we have, um, I think in the first part of the chapter he talks again about uh, things that happen under the sun, uh, oppression, work. Look at verse 4 of chapter 4. Again, I saw that for all toil and every skillful work a man is envied by his neighbor. This also is vanity, grasping for the wind. I can't help but think of all the things that people do where they become experts. I mean, excel in their capability, their talent. Maybe, say, a world-renowned pianist or violinist or whatever. Uh, our time is nearly gone. Uh, chapter 4, 13 and following, political success. Look how many people want that today, badly. They'll do anything to get it. Chapter 5, uh, false religion. Uh, verse 8, hoarded riches, the wealth that, that can be acquired. We're going to have to hurry on over to the end here. Chapter 6, the futility of riches. I've always been impressed by chapter uh, 12 where he talks about old age and how people try to hang on, cling to youth. That's something that people mm -hmm, pursue. Mm -hmm. And yet he says, that's ridiculous. You're going to get old. Bring us then, if you would, Avon, as our time is winding down to the grand conclusion of this thing in chapter 12. 13 and 14 and summarize for us then how we make sense of life, which as you said, seems so fatalistic when you look at it in the early chapters. As he closes, and here's one who's experienced all of this. If you would imagine him as an actor, he comes now to the front of the stage. I've tried all of this. I found it to be empty, vanity, striving after the wind. Of the making of books, there's no end. Much studies the weirdness of the flesh. Hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Translators have actually supplied the word duty, and he's saying this is the totality mm -hmm. of man. This is the whole, the sum. He'll bring every work mm -hmm. into judgment with every secret thing, whether it's good or evil. Mm -hmm. And so he's saying that really there is a relationship that's crucial mm -hmm. in which our response is respect and awe and compliance with His will. Mm -hmm. The conclusion of the whole matter is to fear God. And incidentally, that fear drives out virtually all other fears. Mm -hmm. That'll end that. Fear God 
and keep his commandments. This is the totality of man. Very good. Appreciate that summary. Excellent summary. Fear God and keep his commands. That's what life's about. I'll be back in just a moment. I love you, marvelous book, the book of Ecclesiastes, which has so much insight for us in how to live life every day. We want you to have this material that we've studied. We've only begun to deal with this book. There's so much more. We urge you to open your Bible, turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, and study for yourself. We'd love to give you this uh, study in the form of an audio cassette tape, and it's yours free for the asking if you'll simply write us at The Truth in Love. P.O. Box 865, Hearst, Texas 76053. Request the audio tape on the subject of the book of Ecclesiastes, the title, The Meaning of Life. And we will send that to you, no cost, no obligation. Thank you for watching the program. We urge you to tune in again as we continue our study of the Bible, the only book on this planet that will get us through this life. Take care. Now the full revelation has been given to man. Let us strive for the kingdom by God's clear plan. We must never be swayed by the doctrines of men. Speak the truth in love and grow up unto Him. Thank mm-hmm. you.